Welcome to the Four Witnesses of the Messiah, Chapter 6, Session 6A, The Sermon in the Valley, Part 1. I have been looking forward to this point. When we get to the Sermon in the Valley, this will be my third in-depth pass through this material, each time having learned a significant amount in between. And so now you're going to be treated to two inspired teachers tonight, Ren Minetti and myself, who are going to present our best understanding of this most important and pivotal sermon from multiple perspectives. This presentation by Jesus, like his other major sermons, is multifaceted, layered, and beautifully gem-like. It reflects light from many perspectives, and so Ren and I will be covering the same scriptures, perhaps, but from different angles. Ren had already gotten started having presented in Session 5b the aspect of the coming Holy Spirit to believers. We know from the One Spirit of Original Christianity class that the Holy Spirit given to believers may change in as many as seven ways from administration to administration. Wren presented how Jesus was disclosing all he knew about what was coming in that category. And Wren is loaded up with even more. Because Jesus did not know the great mystery, he was unaware of the church, but he still knew something was coming. And so he was pouring out all that he did know, even sometimes just as he was realizing it. Thus, this sermon is an exciting bridge to the future, spanning between the gospel administration and the church age. My teaching ministry changed course after I returned from a trip to Israel in the spring of 2001. I had started researching and teaching on the three great sermons of Jesus which were the zenith of genuine Judaism and the seed of Christianity. The deeper I got into them, the clearer a picture of my Lord and Savior emerged. Consequently, I was compelled to write my four books on the Sermons on the Mount, on the Plain, and in the Valley. And I'm not done yet. There are two more books brewing along those lines. Before this course change in my life, the focus of my research and teaching had been on one God and original Christianity. But my approach needed to change, for I had been emphasizing who God was not, and upon the wrongs of orthodox doctrines, how they differed from the original. But one cannot effectively stand upon a negative. The overwhelming light from seeing who Jesus my Lord really was like caused me to change my approach into emphasizing who God and His Son really are, and that path has brought us to where we are now. And since I survived COVID, I've redoubled my efforts sprinting to the finish line. So, now I am ready to embark on this third great message, which I have named the Sermon in the Valley. The name given this sermon by other scholars is the Farewell Discourse. But, I've renamed it for two reasons. First, because it literally was begun on Mount Zion. Tradition and the tour guides put that location in a room on Mount Zion, but that's in a 12th century building. After they sang a hymn, the sermon continues as the, the apostles and Jesus walked down the hillside past the temple 
into the Kidron Valley, ending up at the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of the Mount of Olives. Hence, the Sermon in the Valley. And second, it makes up the final symmetry of the three great sermons of Jesus that have been recorded in the Bible. The Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, and now the Sermon in the Valley. Now, huh, of course... This title has absolutely no connection with a book on Satanism published in 2007 which contained a parody of the Sermon on the Mount calling it the Sermon in the Valley. Ah, I actually coined this term first for this sermon in John 13 through 17. I named the Sermon in the Valley in a teaching in the spring of 2001. I named it that because of its wondrous and symbolic symmetry, it now stands so beautifully it can't be tarnished by anything evil that evil can say or do. Another symbolic relationship may be brought out in that the Sermon on the Mount was probably delivered mid-morning, the Sermon on the Plain, midday, and the Apostle of Ordination had occurred earlier that day, and the Sermon in the Valley in the evening. The beauty of this symbolism begs the name change as well. Jesus, God's only begotten Son, unselfishly was about to go into the valley of human need to effect the cure for all mankind, even into the depths of a terrible hell, undeservedly experiencing the ugliest of man's depravities when he was tortured by the gang of unbelieving Roman soldiers, whom, unknown to them, he was even dying for. Then, he would suffer the most excruciating kind of death alone on the cross and be buried for three days and three nights. Well, folks, that's a chasm if I ever saw one. He began these stellar discourses with the Sermon on the Mount, giving forth the most profound speech ever on how to live in the sight of God. He then gave his ministry to mankind at the Sermon on the Plain when he ordained the apostles to teach his doctrines. And now, having been rejected by the Jews, he was about to give his life for all. So, in the Sermon in the Valley, he intended to explain more on Plan B what would be accomplished by his death and resurrection. I wish we had the text of all the teachings that Jesus taught. We've seen throughout this class that the Gospels record summaries of the rest, but these are the three that I believe we have the full text of. I think that's so because of how Jesus packaged them preserving them by means of his stellar use of figures of speech, primarily repetitions, and just like the other two. The content of this one, the Sermon in the Valley, is beautiful, multifaceted, and deep. It is so deep, thousands upon thousands of sermons have been launched by it, by inspired preachers and teachers over the centuries blessings stirring and changing millions of believers but if we realize the unprecedented immense pressure and responsibility that was upon Jesus at this critical moment it makes his delivery of this sermon even more amazing and remarkable please turn John 13 1 John 13 1 it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Jesus knew that his hour was come. This involves the greatest contradiction of all time. Jesus, a most cherished and profound teacher of truth, the Son of Man, 
the paragon of our species shared something with only the worst of humanity. Like a condemned criminal on death row, he knew how and when he was going to die. Could you function with that hanging over your head? Jesus did, and did so superbly. Once we understand what Jesus knew, and, and when he knew it, and what he had to do about it, then what Jesus said and did in this sermon will become even more astounding. But the pressure actually was even more intense for now, the pivotal act which would determine the su success or failure of all eternity depended upon him. John 13, 3. John 13, 3. Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. All things have been given into his hands. How would you function knowing that? Could you sink the three-point buzzer beater shot that would win the game? There was a lot of unfinished business that needed to be handled, and the clock was ticking its final seconds. Accordingly, one can easily discern the eclectic nature of this teaching. There were a number of diverse subjects that he had to deal with because, in a little while, time would expire, and he'd have to go away. Loving one another, the coming comforter, being one with God, etc., he had to effectively cover all this important list in the little time left. That was no small task. But we shall see that he did so in amazing fashion packaging in layer after layer of profound truths in his customary way, even while being sidetracked by the apostles' questions, both good and inappropriate. <laughs> there was the crucial need to build this transition to what was to come with forever hanging on his success or failure at the cross. But surreally, the apostles had little clue as to what horrible events were about to come crashing down upon them all. So, here is my first level of analysis. Just like in the Sermon on the Mount, there are repetitions in this discourse which structure and rule its content. There are nine occurrences of, quote, a little while. And there are nine, quote, these things I have said to or commanded you, unquote. Interestingly, in the Sermon on the Mount, there were nine Beatitudes at the beginning and nine Proverbs at the end. Therefore, there's the kind of symbiosis between these two sermons. One at the beginning, portraying the real way to live, knowing that God is watching and responding by living the Beatitudes. And the one at the end, portraying a new way to live in Christ, in his name, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. But that's not all. My second level of analysis involves the glory perspective, which Jesus introduced in John 13, 31, and 32. And that perspective involves Jesus' seven expectations of what would happen, quote, when I go to my father, unquote. And that wasn't when he died. That was when he ascended to God's right hand. That's when he would be glorified. And that fits with the seven titles of the Messiah that echo throughout the whole Bible. That's what we're going to cover. And that's electric. But even that's not all. The third level of analysis concerns the over 50 occurrences of God spoken of as a father in this sermon. Jesus had presented five actions of our father and five responses toward our father in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Now, in this sermon, the other two will be presented to bring the totals to seven. Whoa, Nelly. And there's even more, because Rand has more perspectives to present. Our coming sonship and his ideas on everything up to the limit of the mystery. Were there more things to say? Yes. But Jesus said they couldn't bear them then. Huh. Like I, I have a note beside that verse in my Bible when Jesus said that. And it reads in capital letters, Darn! <laughs> oh, to have been a fly on the wall, to have heard that sermon. Well, Ren and I are going to give you the best equivalent we can. Hallelujah, sock it to you. Finally, unless we see more, there are two instances of the phrase, quote, Now I tell you before it comes that when it is come to pass, you may believe, unquote. That is going to disclose a scintillating truth behind Jesus' presentation. So, fasten your seatbelt, folks, but don't lock your tray tables, because we're going to be feasting on the Word for the next few sessions, however long it takes, because right now we don't know how long this fight is going to be. <laughs> so, the first perspective, the ruling repetition in this sermon is the phrase, quote, these things have I spoken to you, unquote. For following most of them is a purpose clause beginning with that, hina in Greek. An analysis of the clauses clearly infers his intent for the sermon. So you know why he's giving this. This divides up the sermon into nine separate subjects with a prayer at the end. It is unusual that in almost all of these, these things I have spoken unto you, phrases, the word spoken is in the perfect tense in Greek. And it could have been in the aorist tense, the simple past. But the perfect tense conveys a sense of completeness, a being finished. Let's take a look at the um, first one, John 14.25. John 14.25. These things, and the Greek word is tau, ta, have I completely spoken laleo unto you. I'm translating the perfect tense there by adding the word completely. So, these things have I completely spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I said, aorist tense, unto you. Well, what things was he talking about in this section, ended by these things? Well, he talked about love one another. He talked about, I'm preparing a place for you in my Father's house. He talked about, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He spoke about, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He also spoke about, he that believes in me shall do the same works and greater. He also spoke about, whatever you ask in my name, you shall receive. And he spoke about, you shall receive a comforter, a new motivator. And he said, I will be in you and you in me. And he said, I will reveal myself to you. Wow! That just about encapsulates Christianity in that first these things I've spoken unto you. And then he said, and if you didn't remember it all, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you. Ha <laughs> ha! That's great. Next one, next one is John fifteen eleven. John fifteen eleven. These things have I completely spoken, Laleo, unto you. That purpose clause, my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be fulfilled. What things? In verses 1 through 10 in John 15, the word abide is repeated 11 times, and then a 12th time a few verses later. 
and the phrase, quote, abide in me and I in you, is repeated three times with variations. So, this stresses the importance of staying in fellowship that our joy may be full. The next one, John 15, 17. John 15, 17. These things I completely command you, that you love one another. Well, what things? In verses 12 through 16, that you love one another is repeated at the beginning and at the end, which frames it. In between, Jesus said that if we keep his commandments, he will be our friend and our fruit will remain. Then the next one, the next section, John 16, 1. These things have I completely spoken unto you, that, Hina, purpose clause, you should not be offended or caused to stumble. Well, what things were in that group? In verses 18 through 27 of John 16, Jesus explained that the world hated him first, and since he chose them out of the world, it would hate them too. So don't be surprised and be caused to stumble because of that. Next one is John 16, 4. John 16, 4. But these things have I completely told you, Laleo, spoken to you, that, he not, same word, purpose clause, when the time is come, you may remember that I told you of them, what things? In verses 2 and 3, he said they would shun them and worse. John 16, 6. John 16, 6 is the next one. But because I have completely said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. What things are in this section? In verses 4 and 5, he spoke to them that he was leaving them and going to the Father. The next one, the next section is John 16.25. These things have I completely spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time comes when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. What things? In verses 7 through 24, he spoke to them that he will go away and send the Comforter, who will reprove the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment, and also will guide them into all truth, and also that in a little while he will go away, but their grief would be turned into joy, and that whatsoever they ask in his name shall be done. The next section, John sixteen thirty three. John 16:33 These things have I completely spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world you shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world what things did he speak in that section in verses 26 through 32 that Jesus came forth from the father and goes back to the father but the hour is coming that they would be all scattered. And the last one, John seventeen thirteen, John seventeen thirteen. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak, present tense, not perfect tense. I speak laleo in the world, that, purpose clause, they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What things there? In verses 1 through 12, that his glorification was eminent, that they would be given everlasting life, and that he has poured out all the Father has given him, and that they may be one with God. Oh, wow! There you have the explanation of the purpose of the entire sermon. It's divided into sections by that phrase. Now, I think that we can see the finality 
and completion conveyed by the perfect tense in his words, I have spoken, completely spoken. But there's more impact to that finality and completion that is conveyed by the switch to the present tense in the last one. This is because in this section of that sermon, in that last section, Jesus said, look at John 17, 6. John 17, 6. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So, I think that when Jesus used the perfect tense for the other ones, the other eight occurrences of that phrase, I think that he was referring to, to the apostles' entire education ever since they joined Jesus' ministry and started learning at his feet. I think, then, that we could actually go back and catalog everything they had been taught under the headings of these nine statements of the subjects mentioned in this sermon. Hence, in a way, This sermon was a commencement speech at their graduation. Jesus was saying, I thoroughly, completely taught you these things. But not only what Jesus spoke looked back on what they'd been taught, it also looked forward into what Jesus anticipated in the future when another paraclete, encourager, motivator, would take over in his stead. So, Jesus actually wouldn't really be absent. We're going to see how that fits. Therefore, it's quite apparent that the intent of the sermon was to prepare the apostles to weather the stormy catastrophe which was coming and to encourage them to carry on afterward. After all Jesus had built, the apostles had to remain intact and moving forward for the Christian faith to survive and grow. But the future element of what Jesus taught also was exciting. For this teaching was an important part of the plan A being replaced by plan B theme, which had been growing in crescendo during this phase of his ministry. Jesus was revealing many profound, stellar truths and expectations, which would become the foundation for Christianity. In computer terms, it was like a core dump. When the computer dumps out a snapshot of its entire memory. This was Jesus at a unique high point in his understanding of prophecy and his role in it. That fact is demonstrated by the staggering amount of future prophecy contained in this sermon. So... With that introduction, we're ready to begin to cross the bridge into the future, into the spiritual consequences of Christ's ministry, and into something wonderful. There is so much to say. It's going to take several sessions, and we're going to cover it in detail, like was done for the Sermon on the Mount. This is the path into eternity. The Sermon on the Mount laid the foundation, and the Sermon on the Plain built on it, They together were the zenith of Judaism and the seed of Christianity. But now, we are ready to consider this final sermon. It focuses upon the future, which is going to arrive in a little while. When Jesus went to his Father. And it began, the sermon began with a glorious fanfare. This glory involved none other than the greatest victory possible, the prize of all the ages the reversal of Adam's fall, and the permanent ratification of the path into eternity. So, Jesus exalted, albeit for a moment, 
but he was revealing what really motivated him in John 13 31 John 13 31 therefore when he Judas was gone out Jesus said now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him the first phrase in verse 32 is not in the text God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him this these two verses John 13 31 and 32 indicated Jesus's expectations regarding his outcome once the traitor and his darkness left the room it was as if a weight was lifted off and Jesus exalted the word glory is repeated several times lots of people use that word but exactly what does glory mean there also was something Jesus said about glory that was really special in verse 31 the English present tense word is that's there in that verse in the Greek is actually aorist past tense but the glory clearly had not yet happened now this is stunning the Greek aorist tense has many applications some of which imply a punctiliar one-time deal point of action a single point in time that occurs in Greek moods other than the indicative so this point can sometimes be in the past present or even future the one-time point but here in this verse it's in the indicative mood so that punctiliar one-time deal stuff does not apply A.T. Robertson the famous Greek scholar describes this wording here as a vivid idiom quote a vivid transference of the action to the future unquote Jesus did not originally speak this in Greek he spoke Aramaic but the gospel translator accurately conveyed Jesus's confident assertion assuming that it was inevitable he was that committed in carrying out what was required he was that sure of its outcome talk about positive confessions ah each section of the sermon includes a prediction and this one is vivid but what is glory if we consult the lexicons we can get a taste of what this word really means we're going to start with Charles Robeson's definition and build from there he starts with its basic definition and then its figurative quote by metonymy unquote meaning so here's Robeson quote a glory is a seeming and appearance opinion that is which one has of any thing or in which one is held by others it is an estimation a reputation hence in the New Testament honor and glory namely a spoken of honor due or rendered that is praise or applause B in the New Testament spoken also of that which excites admiration to which honor etc is ascribed namely uh, a, a B sub a of external condition that is dignity splendor glory so by metonymy that which expresses or exhibits this dignity etc spoken of kings regal majesty splendor pomp magnificence then we have B sub B of an external appearance luster brightness dazzling light these are all the different facets of glory B sub gamma of internal character that is glorious moral attributes excellence or perfection B sub delta of that which 
exalted state of blissful perfection, which is the portion of those who dwell with God in heaven. <laughs> That's a great mouthful, isn't it? In his critical Greek lexicon, E.W. Bollinger adds, quote, that appearance, glory is that appearance of a person or thing which attracts attention or commands recognition. Not the person or thing or itself whose glorious appearance attracts attention, but the appearance of it which attracts attention. Hence, splendor, glory, brightness. And then finally, Thayer adds another dimension. Quote, Glory is as a translation of the Hebrew kabod, K-A-B-O-D, in a use foreign to Greek writings, splendor, brightness. One, properly the light of the sun, moon, and stars, used of the heavenly brightness by which God was conceived of as surrounded, and by which heavenly beings were surrounded when they appeared on earth. Glory which with the face of Moses was once made luminous, and also Christ in his transfiguration. So that's glory. Go over that a few times in the lexicons. It'll make your head explode. It's out of this world. Jesus experienced a taste of this glory at the transfiguration. That was the joy that was set before him as stated in Hebrews. Furthermore, when he declared this using the title that the Son of Man would be glorified, it revealed his understanding that this act was tied to Adam. God was to be glorified as well because he sent Jesus as his representative. But the next verse, John thirteen thirty two, takes that to another level because it said, God shall also glorify him, Jesus, in himself. Now, the quote-unquote in himself is a reflexive pronoun that must refer back to the subject of that sentence, which is God. That's remarkable. But what can that mean? That God will glorify Jesus in himself, in God's self. Wow. Since his son, whom he sent, was going to be glorified, God as his father was already vicariously going to be glorified. That's just like when a son scores a touchdown, his, his mom and dad are glorified. But this is even greater. So that statement is full of spiritual mystery and power. What can it mean? Well, folks, it's so big, we don't have enough time in this session to start that. So stay tuned for more <laughs> in a future session. The apostles did not have any time to contemplate the beauty and import of what Jesus had just given them in those two verses, because right afterwards, Jesus declared the first, quote, in a little while, unquote, statement. At any moment, some of the apostles' fond reverie, thinking about glory, would have been slammed back down to earth. What? You can't be leaving. If we put ourselves in the apostles' sandals, we'd understand that when they heard that, it was earth-shaking. John thirteen thirty three. Little children, yet a little while, and I'm with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, wow. So, this was earth-shaking. Where is he going? The apostles had been with Jesus for months. They'd forsaken their vocations and taken leave of their families to follow him. The things they had witnessed in his presence were incredible. The truths they had learned at his feet were wondrous. The master teacher had touched and changed their lives immeasurably. He'd given them power to heal and raise the dead, and they'd exercised it. Yeah, for anyone who's learned at the feet of a real man of God, it's a profound experience that one never wants to end, even though by its very nature, 
It is to have an end when the little birds leave the nest to fly out on their own. But oh, may that day tarry while we soak in the love and light and truth and experience all we can. But Jesus was saying, now is that time. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Wow, that idea of separation had to be stunning, even painful. It'd be hard to accept. So Jesus had to say, in a little while, nine times. Jesus was trying to say goodbye. However, as we're going to see, this message was much more than that. That's why I don't refer to the sermon by its usual name, the farewell discourse. A light is shining brightly, illuminating everything that Jesus is saying in the sermon. What can that be? We've already noted it in the Apostle John's introduction. It's our Savior's wondrous, magnificent love. The next item on his agenda was to emblazon a hallmark for Christianity, genuine agape love. That was the future component of this section. Jesus is now about to describe the very thing which propelled him and will become the enduring trait of his followers. Look at John thirteen thirty four. John thirteen thirty four. A new commandment I give unto you, a new one, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love one another. And by this all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Well, my question and challenge to you is, do people know you that way? Genuine Christian love is not an emotion, for Jesus commanded it. One cannot command an emotion. Agapao love is a commitment. It is a decision. It's a relentless devotion. It is, I've decided to love you and there's nothing yet you can do to make me stop. The other kind of love, phileo, is lesser human, conditional, and emotional. That kind of love is, I will love you if you love me. Or, I love you because... Or, I'll love you when, <laughs> etc. This sermon built upon the foundation laid by the Sermon on the Mount and reinforced by the Sermon on the Plain. Those sermons def- reflected the doctrine and philosophy of Christ's ministry. And loving one another was the maturation, the high point of the section in the Sermon on the Mount regarding the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. Loving our enemies and praying for those who despitefully use us was the supreme standard-setting expression of the process of overcoming evil with good. This goal was so important to God that he backs it by rewarding those who achieve it with double what they lost. So, If we Christians are to attain that high standard, loving one another is not only possible, it's a requirement. Soon, all believers would be part of the body of Christ, which would have one body functions, which would be beyond the individual level. They would be collective in nature, beyond the mere sum of the parts stuff. That would require loving one another. We in our culture today are constantly inundated with information revolving around phileo, human love. It's in our latest hit songs and needing love or losing love or rejoicing in love, etc. It's a reoccurring theme in movies and TV shows and plays and books. All this constant volume of information actually clouds and erodes our understanding of true agape love. Because 
That is the much higher love, different from that other love. The world is controlled by an evil landlord since Adam surrendered his dominion of it. Satan's instance shipped, shaped it into something which stands against everything godly. And that's why we need to study the Bible and pray daily. Else the world would suck our faith out of us. That's the way the world's designed. Something similar happens with our concept of love through sheer volume. The world's concept of human love continually dilutes our understanding of divine love. So, let's consider again and reestablish what God's love really is. Please turn to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not agape love, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. You can do all that wonderful stuff, but if you don't have love, what good is it? Verse 2. And though I have prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but not have charity, agape, I'm nothing. We can have all the showy external traits, yet it would be a sham because we don't have genuine love. Do it all for the wrong reasons. Therefore, love must be an inner reality, a motivation, a philosophy, a mental discipline, a core value, not something superficial. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, oh, look at me, look at me, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. The very essence of genuine love is its profits. Everything. That implies... It must be a foundational entity, a primal activator, something which must be at the very basis or origin of everything to make it genuine. 1 Corinthians 13.4 Agape suffers long. It's compassionate in the long run. It is kind. Agape envies not. It's not jealous. Agape does not brag about itself. It is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself in an inappropriate, unethical way. It seeks not her own. Is not provoked. Uh, you notice the word easily is not in the text. It's par oxudo, which means to be spurred to anger. Agape thinketh no evil. It's noteworthy that the word easily there in verse 5, it's not in the text. <laughs> I, I really could not find any connotation to include that in there. The REV Bible also omits the word easily. It's not provoked, spurred to anger. Then we also have to consider thinketh no evil. Now you know what? That's impossible as stated. Because we live in the world and we see evil all the time. Us ministers have to counsel people against it. So we do have to assess things in our minds to discern what is evil. So the word thinketh there is the key. It is the word logizomai, L-O-G-I-Z-O-M-A-I, logizomai. The best way to explain that is the Ben Franklin method of decision making. That is... When you 
draw a vertical line down a sheet of paper, and then you write all the reasons why you should do something on one side of the paper, and all the reasons why you should not do it (laughs) on the other side. And then after you make sure you have all them written down, then you can weigh the pros and the cons to decide what to do. You know, it's easier once they're all written down. So, after all that process of weighing the pros and cons, the love of God does not conclude evil. That's how it works. You got it? Agape love is not emotional. It is a commitment. It is a deliberate decision that after all is evaluated, it does not arrive at an evil conclusion. It overcomes evil. It has a positive effect. Hence, it is the love from God. The of God, quote unquote, is a translation of the genitive case. And as such, it's possible to translate it as an objective genitive, a love for God. However, we've seen the end result of that. For that justifies all kinds of terrible things in a commitment at all costs and leaves a wake of destruction behind it. Terrorists have such devotion for their God, which they think justifies their acts. But... This love we Christians are revealing and promoting is a love that has ethics and it is pure in its effects. Therefore, it is not a love for God, but a love of God. It has something emanating from God in it. But it also is not merely the love that God has, i.e. God's love. For we can see its impetus and goals. Therefore, its primary force must be a genitive of origin. The love out from God. The love of God. The love from His very essence. Spreading, glowing, kindling, in kind responses in us. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things, and it endures all things that the Word says it should endure. Genuine love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all the things the Bible says it should. It has no evil in it. And in the end, it triumphs over all evil. First Corinthians thirteen eight. Agape never fails. Because God has established love where it is, it's so foundational, because it's his essence out from him, energized and backed by him. It overcomes all and never fails. So love can truly be a relentless devotion that says, I love you, and there's nothing you can do to make me stop. Jesus embraced his Father's love and exemplified it in its greatest way. And then now he commanded his disciples to, quote, love as I have loved you. This now is to become the enduring emblem of Christianity. But Jesus brought up another concept in the same breath. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this you all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. He said to love one another. It's repeated three times for emphasis. You know, that's the real litmus test of love. Anybody can say, I love God. But the proof of that is if we let 
God's love change us into love verse. If we love one another, it proves that we truly have the love of God. In the times to come after Pentecost, a collective, quote-unquote, one another aspect to our spiritual existence in the body of Christ was going to be revealed. Most of that concept at this time was still locked up in God's heart, hidden in the great mystery. But soon after Jesus ascended to God's right hand, I bet it was the next order of business after Christ's coronation. God says to Jesus, Welcome to heaven in your new position and your new job, my son. But I've had this secret I can't wait any longer to tell you. <laughs> and then he tells him about the great mystery. Woo! One of the aspects of this wondrous and profound sermon is its prophecy-fulfilling aspects. The repair job we saw in each successive age was going to take significant, bold, and broad steps after Jesus died, rose, and ascended. And Jesus was laying the foundation for that which was to come. And it's fascinating to understand that when he finally got to focus on the introduction part of the sermon, the first order of business was love. You see, love is really that basic to everything. Yeah, there's great power and great knowledge and glory coming soon. But like First Corinthians 13 said, hey, it wouldn't be nothing if not found in love. So, our response to that love is critical. Because we are so loved, we must embrace it and make it part of us like it was a part of God and His Son. And then we must apply it and love one another. And that takes dedication and work. Because sometimes some of us are hard to love. <laughs> and in so loving, we will come to know God deeper for we will be loving like he is. Let's turn to First John 4, 7. We'll finish up here. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God, for God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Love is the spiritual verity and adeptness which comes via the Spirit. How can we love like that? Because God guarantees it. He backs it. He is it. We never have to give up on our love because God never will. So if we really love God, we can love one another. First John 4, 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us. Unlovable us. And sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. See, love is the model for all the wonderful things that we receive from God because he loves us vertically and then we respond and we love him back but because that love fills us so we also can love one another horizontally with the same love that he loves us with we imitate him and broadcast our love horizontally in the same way that he does vertically because this is the pattern for all that we receive from God we receive grace and peace vertically and then we share the same with one another horizontally God gave us our spiritual gifts vertically and we share them horizontally with the same grace that we were gifted with in love no strings attached. First John fourteen twelve. First John fourteen twelve. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us 
and his love is perfected, ended, fulfilled in us, it has reached its goal. Loving one another is how we practically apply the concept of love. God started it out in that he loved us first, that if we respond by loving one another, his love has had its intended effect. It's perfected. Genuine love is manifested by giving, by grace, by favor, and by mercy. Its dedication is the catalyst for our obedi obedience to his word. 1 John 4.16 1 John 4.16 And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. You want that? Genuine agape love is the key to God's heart. It is the foundational axiom for spiritual life. If we devote ourselves and follow its path, it will lead us into the center of God's will. We will reach God's goal for us, which is dwelling in in God and he in us to dwell is to make one's home then in the ages 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 to come he will shower us with more and more favor as we live in him and he in us it's fascinating to realize that this is the same goal where this sermon's headed in John 17 it all starts with love and ends with us being in Him, one with God. When we adopt God's love and heart as our own and reach out one to another with that same love, something beautiful happens. Our love gets perfected. Our love gets fulfilled. Our love reaches its goal, just like His love did in us. 1 John 14, or 4, 17. 1 John 4, 17. Herein, in that dwelling, is our love made perfect, ended, fulfilled. It reaches its goal. That. We may have boldness in the day of judgment. All the judgment going on all the time, now and in the future, will be rewarded because as he is, so are we in this world just as God motivated by love reached down to us we with the same love reach out to the world if we do that then as he God is so are we in the world our bold love will be just as decisive as his love for we will be as fully committed to give it as he is. That commitment and relentlessness is the boldness which characterize both. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, that love that we reach out, that reaches its goal, because we don't quit, that perfect love casts out fear. We're committed. There's no room for fear. Because fear hath torment, that's restraint. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So you got fear, there's more work to do, right? Love and fear are mutually exclusive. For one who is fully committed has no room for any hesitation. That word translated torments, the Greek word colossus, from the verb means to prune, like to prune trees, to cut off. Hence, to destroy that which was cut. And so, then it concentrates on the growth that can remain. So here in this verse, the punishment aspect is not implied. Just the original uh, idea of cutting off, hesitating, not letting things get to its goal. That is, if we, because of fear, prematurely cut off our love before it reaches its goal, if we hesitate, and are not bold enough through to the end, then you know, that's a sign you got to do some more work. You're not made perfect yet. 
You have more heart work to do. Verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. So, if we truly are devoted to God, we're also going to love our brethren, one another, as Jesus said. But as Jesus was about to continue on to develop this teaching on love, Peter interrupted him. But we're going to have to resume my analysis next week. Meanwhile, we're going to hear from Redmond Eddy next. So that's the session.